Well, let's read these verses together. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp or put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do pray that you would help us to understand our uh, position uh, in you. Lord, you tell us what we are before you tell us what to do. And because of our transformation uh, that has come about through our faith in you, through the drawing of your spirit, through the salvation that was obtained not by anything we did, but by everything you did on our behalf, uh, we have been drawn into a new life, but also new purpose, new meaning. And Lord, I pray for each of us here that we would have our minds shaped not by the age in which we live, but that our minds would be shaped by your scriptures, more importantly, by your lordship, uh, for you are the author of the scriptures. And we pray, Jesus, that we would recognize as children of your kingdom that being a part of your kingdom means that we are under your rule. And I pray that we would see that you save us, not that we would be born into some kind of personal, self-centered vacuum, but you save us into a family, and you call us to be witnesses uh, to your truth and your reality. For the Lord, the world is lost and broken and hurting, as many are even here tonight. And I pray, Jesus, that you, who come to set us free, um, would do that very thing tonight. And may your beauty shine forth, and may we be transformed by it. Um, Holy Spirit, we invite you to teach us and bring to remembrance all that Jesus has said. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Good to see all of you. Uh, I have not been in the pulpit over the last three weeks. Uh, due to, uh, just so you guys know, personally, as we talked about salt and light, you know, this is not an address to individuals. This is an address to communities, that we as a community are the salt and the, and the light of the earth, which means that we in order to witness to Jesus well, it begins with how well we care for one another. Uh, and this has been a rough few months for, for my family. Uh, my wife has been extremely sick uh, since May, and we didn't really know what was going on. She was incredibly anemic, and uh, through a whole bunch of tests, uh, just this week she had a hysterectomy on, on Tuesday, um, which the doctor said she'd be down for six weeks, and she didn't believe that she would be down for six weeks. She will be down for six weeks. <laughs> uh, so it's been a, and my wife is a, um, we're both drivers, so we're intense and passionate people, and uh, being confined to your couch when you're uh, a person who sees every detail of what needs to happen in life is very challenging for her. So just pray that she'll stinking hold still and let her body heal, <laughs> and, uh, and that I would be gentle with her, because I made her cry twice this week, telling her to sit down on the couch and stop working. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we recognize often uh, the importance of community through the different trials and, and difficulties that we go into, and I, I just will segue into this message by saying that when you are born again, you are not born again into a vacuum, uh, but you are born again into a family. Uh, and people often ask me, is, the, is it necessary uh, to be a part of the church to be a Christian? And I would say that you're not a Christian uh, apart from the church, for the church is the very thing that you were born into. Um, and it takes expression in local communities where God's people come together who have been, been, uh, been confronted with the reality of the living Christ, that our salvation is not an individual, a private affair, but it is an outward uh, expression in which we have been so touched by Jesus that the self-life is, is of least importance to us, and the life of Jesus and the life of others becomes of supreme importance, um, and that is expressed and accomplished through the church. And so looking at these passages, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, it's one of those passages that 
it's so concise and so clear that we often overlook uh, what is being said. And Jesus is basically declaring to his disciples that those who are blessed, those who are blessed who have recognize their need to have been confronted with the living Christ. Jesus is, is, is the king who's revealing the kingdom. He says the kingdom has come near. Um, it's come upon us. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is here, but it is coming in full. And we are who have recognized the king um, and who are a, a, a peculiar people that have been radically transformed by our faith in his life and death and resurrection um, have now come under his rule and coming under his rule, we are given this incredible commission uh, to, uh, to partner with him uh, in declaring the truth of who he is um, in both word and deed. And when we read these words, we often, because we've been so permeated with an individualistic uh, culture, we read them as if they're written just to you alone. You are the light of the world. Like, you are. And when he's saying this, he's saying, you all, you who are my disciples, you, the community, you, the church, are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so I want us to see what is being stated in this, because there are two major dangers that approach us um, in the age in which we live, and there are two things that are directly opposed opposed to what Christ has come to accomplish in his world through his church. And that is the danger, first of all, of assimilation. The danger of looking more like the world rather than being salt and light in the world. The danger of actually viewing Christianity and Christ through the lens of culture rather than looking at culture through the lens of Christ. The danger of actually having little to no impact upon the city in which we have been called uh, to be salt and light in uh, because of our likeness to the very culture which we have been called out of. As a unique and peculiar people, salt, if it means anything, it means that it is distinct, and yet it brings, it, it brings, uh, it brings a protection against decay as well as flavor <laughs> to whatever it touches. Uh, and if it isn't doing those two things, it's useless, is essentially the word of Jesus. And light is not something that we hide, um, but it is something that is meant to bring illumination uh, to everyone it comes in contact with. And so Jesus gives this very incredible statement. He says, this isn't what you are trying to be. This is what you are, if indeed you're mine. This is what you are. And he says, as a community, you need to understand this. This is a communal address, and I think it's important to once again remind you that the church is a community that exists under Jesus in freedom for the world. We exist under Jesus in freedom. The gospel sets us free to live no longer for ourselves, for that was enslavement, but to live freely for the world which God gave his only son for. And so we look at this and we see that, this, that, the, that God calls us to live in freedom for the world and sends us out into it because in Jesus we see that God is not just involved with the suffering of the world, but literally in Jesus he has become fully identified with that suffering. That his sympathy isn't just that he feels sorry for us, but he's actually willing to get involved, to get his own hands dirty, if you will. And he calls us to enter into that active and experimental knowledge that the church becomes a witness to the truth of God's direct and deep abiding concern for humanity um, by us being a witness to that through word and through deed. And in, it is in doing that that we truly are salt and light. This is a communal address, but secondly, I want you to notice that it's about identity. It, it answers the why um, of Christianity. It answers the why of salvation. It's not, about, it's not about you trying to be something. It addresses what you are in Jesus. You are. This is emphatic. It's not you ought to be. 
I think one of the great reasons that, uh, that brings so much discouragement to the Christian life is that we are constantly attempting in our own effort to be something that we can only be in Christ. That we aren't working toward victory, but we are working from it. And if we don't understand our position, that it all begins with grace. Jesus declares what we are before he asks us to do anything. The beauty of the gospel is God makes us a new people and gives us a new identity and a new purpose. And in that is in that identity that he calls us now to figure out what it means to work out that identity, work out your salvation, we're told in the scripture, with fear and trembling. And so this, this identity is that because we are in Christ, who is the light of the world and who is the salt of the earth, we, by our identification with him, become that. We don't imitate it. We are that by the fact that his spirit comes to dwell within us as a new covenant people, as a, as a new creation. If anyone be in Christ, the old has passed away and the new has come. This is our identity. It's an incredible revelation of grace. The, the Sermon on the Mount, before Jesus gets into Christian ethics, how then shall we live, he first of all says, this is what you are because of what I have done on your behalf. I think it's one of the great challenges that we're constantly trying to figure out how to become what we should be. But Jesus says, no, you need to learn to become what you already are. I think that that's a great challenge for the Christian life because we do not understand our identity in Jesus. And then I think finally this, this passage is not only opens up for us uh, our community, our identity, but it opens up for us our, our mission and the warnings that follow the declaration, the blessing, remind us that there is a real danger in our ability to not become what we are. Because the gospel, if it's a gospel of freedom, means that he sets us free. And to be free means that we now are responsible for being what he has declared us to be in himself. And this is, you know, this, it becomes this paradoxical reality. God has done everything on our behalf through Jesus and as we put our trust in that, we become free now to participate in not in saving people, but in being a witness and in witnessing to the reality of what Jesus alone can do and has done and, and will do. Uh, we, by doing that, bring a, a, um, a preservation against decay as well as a flavoring of life because we bring total meaning to total life through the gospel as well as illumination uh, to the truth of who Jesus are because we, we become a people who have come out of hiding um, and, and in bringing illumination to the reality of Jesus, uh, we become a revealer of, of, of darkness which causes some to run away from us uh, and it causes others to be drawn uh, into the beauty of who Jesus is. And so the church is meant to have a direct, concise, and real impact upon the society in which it's placed. And I think that this is, as I have reflected on this, I, I become deeply troubled by uh, the loss of flavor at times in my own life, or the, the hiding of the light that has come to me. Uh, and this is why I'm reminded that this is indeed a communal, a communal address because all of us individually will have moments of brokenness, of failure, where we come short, where our light is hidden, where our, our saltiness becomes not so salty. And we need one another to hold each other accountable, to encourage one another and love intentional community and that we might reflect and keep our light bright and to keep our influence um, effective because I essentially believe that salt is about our influence and light is about our visibility. When I first started Door of Hope, I remember one of the things that impacted me was, was the fact that I would meet so many, like young people would come to the church and they'd be like, like, well, we work together. I didn't know you were a Christian. And I was like, I didn't know you were a Christian. They're like, that's awesome. I'm like, that's not awesome. <laughs> That's actually problematic. Uh, that's actually a revelation that we have some wacky ideas about what Christianity is about. For Jesus says, whatever you are told 
in private, you must declare from the rooftops. He says, whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. And in the witness of the church, how do churches die? Churches die when they lose sight of who they are in Christ. And that happens because they lost sight of Christ. They fell into the trappings of trying to become relevant and assimilating the ways of the world to attract the world, or they fell into the trappings of trying to protect themselves from the world and become this cloistered, protected community um, when Jesus actually said, I didn't, I don't, Father, I, I didn't call them out of the world. I want to keep them in the world but protected from it, that they might impact it on my behalf. And so when we look at these things, we have to ask ourselves, is door of hope a salty <laughs> and shiny community? I, I really, I think that those are, those are good questions to ask. Do we bring a preservation against decay in our own community as well as the city in which we are called to influence? Are we a people that shine brightly upon the truth of who Jesus is? And is that light seen in the way that we sacrificially give of our lives for the good of one another and for the city in which God has called us to? Because Jesus says, this is what you are. So I believe he's asking us as a church, is this what you're being? And it's a deeply convicting question to ask ourselves. And I think it's essential because as you can tell, the church is continuing to grow and there's no seats and we did the counterintuitive thing. I knew it would happen. Like the moment we cut out a gathering, everybody's like, now let's go to Door of Hope. That's awesome. They cut out a gathering. Now we're going to go. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're growing for the right reasons in healthy ways. And, you know, as the six o'clock really doesn't have much space and the nine o'clock didn't have a single seat available today. And, and so I, I have to step back as... As, as one who, when I started Door of Hope, I remember praying, I'm like, Lord, I, I, I want to be, be leery of ever being caught up in um, the excitement around numerical growth. Help me to not fall into the trappings of the flesh and say, now we're, now we're succeeding. Because that isn't necessarily, uh, it's one gauge of a church's growth, but it's actually not a very good one. A much better gauge is, are we truly being salt and are we being light? And it begins here. Are we being that to one another? And then actually, does Portland even know we exist and do they care? Um, I don't care if the room's full if we aren't actually being salty and being light. Uh, and so let's ask the question then, what does it mean when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth? What does he mean by that? In when he says in Matthew, in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. I think that's interesting. He doesn't just stop there. He's like, you become useless. He actually says, not only do you become useless, but you are thrown out. The only thing you're good for is to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're like, man, it just it seems like you could have just stopped with useless, hurt, hurt enough. <laughs> But you're like, you, you had to take it that extra, you know, just take the knife and twist it. But I think, let's, let's begin with what, what does salt actually do? Salt's been being used by, by humanity for over 6,000 years. Um, for two, I actually figured out three real uses for salt. Uh, salt uh, preserves, uh, it, it, it keeps food from perishing. It's been used as, as a preservative against, uh, as a way of keeping food uh, from going bad, from spoiling. Uh, it's also been always used to flavor things. Salt, people like salt in their food. Um, I think the third and most important thing that salt is used for, and where I want to spend the rest of my time today, is that salt kills slugs. So I'd like to show you some slides. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I know if I was really good, I could just come up with a bunch of like lame metaphors on how that applies to our, it's about killing slugs, you know? You may know some slugs in life. 
Have you ever put salt on a slug? It's really quite horrifying. I actually was going to show a picture as a joke, and I was so, like, disturbed by it. It was way too early. It literally just burns holes right through them. Uh, it's horrible. Uh, so I, I, I will just stick with preserves and seasons, okay? Um, so when we think of Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth as a preservative against decay, you think about what Jesus is essentially saying if he's saying anything about salt and if he's saying anything about the church is that there is something distinct about us, a goodness that protects against decay that comes through living against the rule of the kingdom. To live at odds against the kingdom is to actually engage in that which will ultimately fail, perish, and decay. Jesus, in coming into the world, God entering into human flesh, God came into Christ to set humanity, which was dead in its sins and and decaying in its self-centered destruction. On the cross, we are told that Jesus actually unhinged the work of the devil, of sin, of death, and of this world system. It's all been dismantled through the work of Jesus. But we aren't seeing the full effect of that. The church is here to remind the world of Christ's victory over those things. In other words, we become a preserving factor for goodness, that where the church is not, all hell breaks loose if the church is indeed functioning as it is intended to function. Now, that's not to say that the church has the capability of making the world Um, It can make it better, but it's not going to make it great because there's this reality until Jesus comes again that, that darkness will still have an incredible influence. But wherever God's people have gathered, as and I like to say that we are, as a church, we're not the kingdom, but we are a kingdom outpost. We are to give the world a glimpse of, in part, of what is coming in full. We are to actually be reflection of what victory over sin, the devil, and and the flesh in this world system looks like. And so the question immediately arises is, does Door of Hope do that? Is Door of Hope a place where darkness does not have control? Now, Obviously, as individuals, we're all from different places. Some of you sitting here probably don't know Jesus at all. And you've come because you've been invited in and you're trying to explore whether or not this Jesus is someone worth following. Well, the, the, the question I'm actually posing to this church is, are we doing a good job of convincing you, if you're here today, that there's something about this Jesus that's worth exploring? Is there a, 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 a flavor, a a preserving factor uh, that is preventing corruption from gaining full control because we need to understand the city that we live in because Portland is a city that has a higher level of depression than any city in the United States. It actually has more strip clubs than even Las Vegas. It's, it is a city that is marked and known throughout the world for being this weird, liberal, eccentric place that is driven by a Peter Pan mentality where young adults can retire and and, and enjoy the pleasures of life without responsibility. That is what we are known for. And we all love it. That's why we're here. But the question is, is how are we influencing it for the king? Because Jesus didn't call us to Portland so that we can enjoy all the incredible food. Although we can enjoy the incredible food, we can enjoy the culture, we can enjoy all the things that Portland has to offer, but are we defined by those things? Is Portland more of an influence upon us than we are on it? One of the most discouraging things that's happened to Door of Hope in the last year, I think, is when the Oregonian recently did an article and one of the big, it was supposed to be on Deeper Well and the music that's coming out, instead it ends up being about it being a hipster church based upon the fact that we have eclectic chairs. And I was like, dang it, Lord, really? (laughs) 
was I in sin to handpick all those chairs? I don't think so. Maybe if you're sitting on a broken one, I was in that moment. But I like, you know, is that really what we'll be known for? Is that we have a beautiful building? That's great. But what makes it beautiful, what should be the, the driving force that is attracting people to what is happening here, is that we actually have an influence over and against darkness. That there is a, a, a preservation that occurs when God's people actually function in love under the authority of Jesus. That's the beauty of the church, if the church is truly the church. I think that not only does salt preserve, but salt also seasons. And then this flavoring that salt brings is, when I like to think of this is that, that salt, I remember what life was like before I met Jesus, that my life was a life that was, that was marked by a certain dullness, a lack of flavor, that there was a lack of meaning and intent in the things that I did. In fact, I was a man who tried to derive activities as a means of escaping the nagging voice of conscience that constantly told me that I was a man who was guilty and deserved judgment. I found, oh, I was brilliant in creating diversions from escaping that voice, but I couldn't escape it for long because there was a point in which I saw my own self-centeredness played out so deeply that I realized that I'm going to lose everything that's meaningful and everything I have tried to do to escape what I know to be true in the depths of my being is no longer serving its purpose and I have nowhere else to turn and I have to find escape or life isn't worth living. And when I met Jesus, he so radically transformed my life, so radically brought new and total meaning to total life. There was a new flavoring, if you will, uh, to existence that there was no possibility of even going back to what I was. In fact, it was so intense that my wife was like, I liked you better when you were depressed and discouraged and doing hard drugs because you're so different now, I actually don't know even what to do with this transformation in your life. You can't go from sleeping until two in the afternoon and staying up till three in the morning doing stupid stuff to all of a sudden getting up every day at four in the morning and then bombarding me with scriptures right when I wake up out of bed. That's, <laughs> it's creepy and I don't like it. And I, and, but, I, but that's the thing is, what did Jesus do? He didn't just come to like, I'm going to save you, but you're not really going to experience anything and everything's going to remain the same and you continue to live the dumb, stupid, wasted life that you were already living, you know, and I, and at le- but at least I'll get you out of hell. I'm like, I need him to get me out of the hell that I was in, in life, because I wasn't living life. The church is called the salt of the earth and that it is meant to bring as a witness to the world total meaning to total life. That there is no facet of existence that Jesus does not get in his hands into. That he can bring robust meaning and value to every single aspect of your existence. He can give you a new lens by which to look at your work, your future, your spouse, your children, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your community, your city. He gives us a whole new way of viewing reality. And if there's no new view and no new lens and a continued dullness and a lack of excitement and wonder and amazement that you who are dead are now alive in Christ, then you should ask yourself, am I really alive in Christ? Because the salvation that comes through Christ was never meant to save us for personal and private purposes. In fact, the evidence that you have been personally and privately radically transformed by Jesus is that you no longer care about what is best for you and care more supremely about what is best for Jesus and his world. And as a community of faith, we have to ask ourselves, do we bring that kind of flavor to Portland, Oregon? Do we bring that kind of flavor to one another? Because if it doesn't happen here, it's not going to happen out there. I always say that as, as Christians, if you truly experience grace, you have no right to be bored. That life 
is too meaningful, even when it's hard, to be bored. I think that flavor, I, think of, I almost think of like bringing just color into something. It's like, it's just bringing this zest. And Jesus says that this is what you are, church, is you are to be a witness to a whole new reality. Uh, uh, you become a force of good that preserves the world against darkness having full control because you are reminding the world that I have overcome darkness. You are to bring flavor to the world in that you bring now total meaning to total life through your witness to my kingdom, through your obedience to who I am as king, both in word and in deed. And this is what's fascinating is that Jesus says if we don't do that, that we can lose our saltiness. Now, this is one of those things. I'm never troubled by, by apparent contradictions in Scripture. I never come across them and go, you know, there's something wrong with the Scripture. I'm pretty much convinced every time I come across what I would consider an apparent contradiction in Scripture that there's something totally wrong with my understanding. That's generally how I approach it. I'd, I trust Jesus more than I trust my own faulty, you know, drug recovered brain, okay? Every time. I'm like, anytime I think I'm right and he's wrong, there's a deep problem and I'm going to pay for it deeply. Uh, and so, but this, this is one that I was actually troubled by. I'm like, I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I'm pretty sure salt can't lose its flavor. So did Jesus not understand what he was talking about? What, what does he mean if the salt loses its saltiness? Because salt is a very simple chemical compound called sodium chloride, it's very stable. It's not like if you leave salt in your cupboard for like five years and you like come in and you're like, I poured it out and it was just like white powder. It was weird. That never has happened to any of you uh, because it doesn't happen. And now we have all these varieties of salt. I, you know what? They're just charging you for the color. Like you're like, this, <laughs> the pink salt is worth the $50 for the small vial that they sell at New Seasons. I'm like, I told I'm like, I think I need the pink salt. <laughs> but it, like, it's weird though. It still tasted like salt. Uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that salt is salt. But, but here's the thing is that what is Jesus? So I, I went online and I was reading. I'm like, can salt lose its saltiness? Because I'm worried that Jesus was confused on this one. And, and it said that, that sodium chloride, because it's water soluble, uh, if crude salt were exposed to condensation or rainwater, the, the sodium chloride could not be dissolved and removed, and the salt could, in effect, lose its saltiness. In other words, if the salt can only lose its saltiness in two ways. And I think that this is what Jesus is getting at. The first is it loses its saltiness when it becomes compromised. Compromised by water actually affects the chemical in such a way that it will, in effect, lose its saltiness. And I think the church loses its saltiness when it becomes compromised by the culture in which it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be flavoring. Instead, the culture flavors it, and we end up a dead church. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. But I think even more importantly, I think what Jesus is really saying, the main point, is that just... As salt, if it's compromised, uh, becomes useless. I think more importantly, that salt, if it is not used for what salt is, is useless. What does salt do? If salt isn't used to flavor and preserve or kill slugs, it really is a meaningless compound. So it is with Christians. If we do not understand that we are primarily saved, that through us you are chosen, that through you God might save all. If you do not understand that primary distinction, you aren't chosen so that you can say, I'm in and they're out. You are chosen by God through Jesus to be a witness to him and to his kingdom, to the world. And if you don't understand that, then you are fooling yourself. You're not salt. You're not salt. You're at least not doing what, because salt even two inches away from food doesn't do anything to it. It actually has to be put on the food to actually have an effect. And the Christian is useless if he does not understand that he is not here for himself or herself, but here for the world. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we compromised or are we cloistered? The bottom line is that we are to be neither. And Jesus says, this is what you are, so don't 
be this, because if you are this, what happens, what happens when the salt becomes useless? We become trampled underfoot. And I think what he means by that is that the church, why would we be trampled underfoot, is that the church essentially becomes unnoticed and unimportant. That that there's nothing, you think about it, if you think about salt as something that flavors brings a certain it brings a flavor to life. It bring, if we as the church are called to bring total meaning to total life, we better as individuals as well as corporately reflect something that actually does that for life. Because we can't say Jesus does that but then still live as if Jesus is the most unexciting and embarrassing thing that I've ever gathered around. And I'll come to church because I might meet a girl, um, which is cool, and I'm happy to help hook you up because there's so many cool people here. Guys, girls, I am the ultimate matchmaker. I really, that's fun. I, I enjoy it. Email me about it. I'll make it happen. Uh, um, but, but that's not the primary purpose of the church. And we have to understand that our responsibility is to, is to, is to actually influence the culture and the society that we're a part of by our witness to Christ. In other words, our witness should be equipping each of you individually to actually flavor that community in which you are a part of in your daily lives. It begins here and it moves out into there. But I think that too often Christians, like, they're not excited about their faith. They don't really care about Jesus. And when someone finds out that you're a part of a church, there's actually this sinking feeling. And I don't know what causes us to actually close our lips and refuse to influence for Christ's sake um, if we're truly been born again and radically transformed by him and his kingdom, then the only thing that I can think is that, that, that we've somehow lost, we've lost our saltiness or we never believed to begin with that, that this is who we are in Jesus. And so what happens if we don't have that kind of zeal, that kind of reality in our lives? I'm not talking about energy, but I'm talking about a calm, assured confidence that I know who I belong to. I love Karl Barth's statement that the church is a community of men and women who have been reconciled to God through Jesus. They are around Jesus and see him and he sees them around himself. And I think that this is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are you confident? Because Paul says that you actually should have assurance of, 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 of who you have believed in and, and what role you have to play in being a part and a witness to his kingdom. And Paul says, he goes, I know in whom I have, I have believed and am confident and convinced that he is able to keep that which he has begun in me, through me. That Paul was actually willing to say, as a follower of Jesus, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because when the world wants to know what Jesus is like, the question that you and I have to ask ourselves is, can we say like Paul, he is like me? Because one of the most convicting things is to even say that feels like blasphemy, but that's exactly what Jesus wants for you and I, is he wants us to be a visible reflection of his invisible reality. We are only salt because we are in him, and he is the true salt of the world. We reflect him. We don't do that well as individuals, but we can do it well as a community. We can. What about light? Light, I think, if salt is about our influence upon the society... And the danger is that the society can influence us, and in doing so, it makes us irrelevant where we become trampled on underfoot. Basically, we go unnoticed. Like, oh, you're a part of a church? I didn't even know you were there. I didn't, you're a Christian? I had no idea. That's that's problematic. It's problematic. Because he doesn't leave it at influence, he brings it into visibility. And this is something that's fascinating, because you notice here, he's, this is what we're to be to the world, but then when he gets into actual Christian ethics, when we move into to how then shall we live, by chapter 6, he talks about all the things that we're to do in, in a way that isn't to draw attention to ourselves. Like He's like, when you fast, don't let anyone know. When you pray, don't pray openly so that people can see how awesome, although I want you to come Friday, because we're going to worship and pray openly. Uh, just don't think you'll be heard for your many words because we all get bored when you pray too long. <laughs> you know who you are. 
You were the one who didn't laugh. No, I just don't. <laughs> it might be me when I'm really tired. Uh, so I think that this is the, the question of light, is that light here, he says, this is the church is meant to be outward. It's, it doesn't exist for itself or for the individual, that Jesus Christ has saved us, that through us he might actually draw others to himself. And this outward expression is done, is, is accomplished through our witness. And, and I love what he says. He says, listen, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. He said, I have elevated you to a place that you might be a beacon. You as a community, door of hope, I have elevated you. I died for you, church. I gave myself for you. I am the light of the world, he says in John. In, in John chapter nine, verse five, I am the light of the world. We are the light of the world. It's reflective light. It isn't light that begins or originates with us. We can't imitate light. If you guys are familiar with a song I wrote actually years ago called The Blessed Light, and the the opening line is, Lord, I'm like the moon. Without the sun, I hang in darkness too. It was just that image of secondary light. The moon is a bright source of light in a, in a night sky only because it reflects the light of the sun. It's secondary light. We are only as bright as Christ's reflection off of us, which means that the responsibility that we have as individuals is to keep ourselves perpetually before and in intimate union with Jesus, not for the sake of private relationship, but for the sake of being energized in such a way that we can actually illuminate the reality of him to the world. You remember Moses in discussing with God face to face his people and his plans, his redemptive history. When he comes down off the mountain, the children of Israel were terrified because the face of Moses literally radiated with the very light of God. Told in scriptures, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So to come into the light means that you come out of hiding. It means that if we are the light of the world, it means that we are a people who have come out of hiding and you don't light a lamp and then put it under a basket, Jesus says. You don't cover up the lamp. If you turn the lamp on, it's for the purpose of illuminating the room and it says it gives light to everyone who is in the room, which means that the light is not just simply so that you can read well, you, without bothering anyone else, it means that you are actually turning on the light that it might illuminate for everyone the reality of what they need and who they are to be. As the church, this is what we are called to do. Light speaks of coming out of darkness and into life. And as a church, our responsibility is to be revealers of Christ's light, Christ's light comes. And this is where I think we can become challenged by the responsibility of the church, is that how do we know if we are shining brightly the truth of Jesus? Is that we will no longer draw from the society in which we are a part of neutral neutral responses. Because Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword, and he is the author of peace. It says that he himself is our peace, who has torn down the middle wall of separation. What is meant by this statement then is that when light comes forth, it reveals. And when we live in the light, we will bring light to others. And what that light does is it will draw some to the beauty of who Jesus is, but it also reveals the sinfulness and the brokenness of our own lives as well as the lives of others. And it creates conflict and some will come Recognizing their deep need, others will be horrified by what, by what our light reveals in them, and they will turn back against us um, and, and will we'll respond negatively. The church has become way too comfortable with no reaction. I think if we were truly living as the light of Christ in the city in which we've been placed, people would not be neutral to us. Some would get saved and some would be offended. Jesus loves them all, but to come into the light is a courageous act because to come into the light means you're coming out of hiding. What is the first thing our first parents did when sin entered into the human story is they hid. When you come into the light, there is no hiding, which means that for us to be light means that we are a transparent and honest people who live according to the truth, not according to the lies that our culture has placed upon us. We have come out 
of the, the, the heaviness and the darkness that comes with a, with, a, with a society that says that you are the most important thing in the universe. And we see the heartbreak that comes from living according to that faulty living because as children of the kingdom, we know that the kingdom alone has the ability to set people free and to bring them into truth and robust meaning in, in existence. And so light must reveal the king, which in turn will cause some to be saved and some to be utterly offended. And I think it's hard for us because we don't want to be offensive because we are taught in our age that what is true for me may not be true for you. No, we declare as children of the light what is true for us is true for everyone. And that is not a popular message in our day. It's not about you go your way, I go my way. We say, no, we all need to go Jesus' way because there will be a day when every knee will bow to Jesus as Lord. And some will bow their knee to him as Lord and judge and others will bow their knee to him as Lord and Savior. And we have a choice to make because the gospel sets us free to make that choice. Will you follow Jesus with me? Do we live in a way that invites people to follow Jesus to come out of death into life? Or are we afraid of the offensiveness of the rigid exclusivity of the claims of Christ which have an all-inclusive uh, element to them because we, it's universal in its application. Because of its, the narrowness of our message, we, we open up the vastness of God's goodness and his love for a humanity that he is willing to identify himself with now and forever. And we should be confident of this. The light that reveals is a light that is reflected. We reflect Jesus' light. But this is the thing that's most important. At the end of the day, when it says, he says, let your light so shine before humanity that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, is that if light reveals, light also does something really fascinating. It conceals. It conceals. To live in the light means that we are able to reflect Jesus in such a way that the attention is not given to us, but the attention goes to Jesus. Because he says, let your light be seen, uh, be seen before humanity. They will see your good works and they will glorify your Father. Notice, they don't glorify you. And this is one of the great litmus tests. Are, are we as a church actually elevating the right things? Because if the church is elevating... What a great teacher, what a great preacher, what a great worship leader, what an awesome chair. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there for lightness. Uh, they, you know, this is, this is not bringing, this is not illuminating the right thing. My prayer, whenever you hear Tim or I preach, is that you walk away saying, what a great savior. When you come in, it's not about the preachers, but it's about the community as a whole that says, what an amazing community that reflects something I so desperately need and want, which is true, selfless, sacrificial love. That brings glory to Jesus. God, the Father, is glorified when his children simply do what they were intended to do, which is bring a witness to him. So I ask you guys in closing, how is our witness? How is our influence? How is our visibility? This isn't a private experience. This is a, a, an experience of a community of men and women who have come to the realization that Jesus Christ is indeed everything that he said he was that he is king of the universe, and we as his people, as, as, as those who have been born again and have entered into the newness of life and have been empowered by his Holy Spirit, which is alone what makes us salty and bright, uh, that we have come to, the, to a place in which we recognize that our greatest satisfaction is found in our total commitment to the witness of Jesus our king and his kingdom. That is what we are called to. And this is why Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. May we simplify our lives to live fully for that one thing, that we may know him and that we might make him known. Amen? Let's pray.